Eric, one of the great motivators to understand consciousness is the concept of self-awareness, being aware of myself being aware. Uh, this has motivated philosophers over the centuries. Uh, you've been a bit of a skeptic of what we really know about what we think we know internally. Why? Well, one of the reasons is that I, when I look at the literature in philosophy and psychology, people who say this is how things are, they seem to disagree with each other in a way that I'm inclined to think doesn't reflect real differences uh, in their underlying experience. So if you look at the history of opinions about imagery or the history of opinions about what it's like to dream or the history of opinions about sensory experience, people will say these radically different things, but on the outside, they behave very similarly. They seem to have very similar kinds of cognitive patterns. So at least on the face of it, it doesn't seem very plausible that people would have inner experience that's as different as you would think it is from their reports. So what are some examples of the differences between reports of a dream or an imagery? So dreaming one is a fun one. It's the first one that I started getting seriously interested in uh, because back in the 1950s, people used to say that they dreamed in black and white. Uh, that color dreams were extremely rare, or if you had a, a dream with color in it at all, it might just be one object that was colored in a mm -hmm. black and white scene. And this had always seemed to me strange. Uh, I remember when I was growing up in the 70s, people saying, oh, do you dream in color? Do you dream in black and white? People don't ask that anymore. Um, and now people say they dream in color. If you look before the 20th century, most people will say uh, or assume that dreams are the kinds of things that have color. So you see this historical arc of opinion about whether we dream in color or black and white. And I guess my inclination is to think that probably the dreams themselves didn't change from color to black and white to color over the course of history. I've got some reasons for thinking that if you're interested. Uh, so if the dreams didn't change, then there are only the reports change. And if people's opinions about something as common as dreaming every night can mm. change radically over the course of history. And that's a sociological effect of, of what they expect to say? I mean, why, is that, why would that be the case? So I'm inclined to think that it has to do with people over-analogizing their dreams to the dominant media of their day. Mm. So if you look before the 20th century, people would anal uh, analogize dreams to uh, tapestries, to paintings. Then you look in the 20th century, people start analogizing dreams to movies. Mm -hmm. And movies were black and white. Mm -hmm. And so I think people would over-analogize and basically say to themselves, well, dreams are like movies, mm -hmm. movies are black and white, maybe they don't remember the color of many of their dream objects, so they say, well, you know, dreams are like movies, I don't remember the colors of the things, so my dreams were black and white. Mm -hmm. Maybe if they remember a color of a specific object, they might say, ah, that thing was colored, but the rest was black and white. Mm -hmm. And then as the media changed again, starting in the 60s, uh, people came to assume again that their dreams were colored. Hmm. So what is the significance of that uh, to our belief that self-awareness is this fundamental property that we have that needs to be explained? If we have this doubt about yeah. what our apprehension of our own internal uh, sense is in reality. Well, it certainly seems like we have some kind of self-awareness, mm -hmm. right? I wouldn't go so far as to deny, you know, right now that I'm having any visual experience at all, right? It does seem like I'm having visual experience, right? Um, and that's a fact that needs to be explained. But I guess the issue is that people who have been interested in this have often focused on simple cases. And I think philosophy and psychology can make a mistake by I mean, it seems like a good idea. Start with a simple case first and then yeah. build to the complex, difficult case. But the, the problem with starting with simple cases sometimes is that you get misled into thinking that they're characteristic, right? So when philosophers have talked about our self-knowledge, they often use examples like, I'm having a visual experience of seeing red right now, mm -hmm. you know, and you're, I'm looking at this canonically red object right in the middle of my visual field. And then it seems really hard to doubt that I could be seeing red or we're experiencing canonical pain. Red and pain seem to be what mm -hmm. philosophers are always talking about when they talk about self-knowledge. Smell of garlic and cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so yeah, those kinds of cases, it seems like if you start with those kinds of cases and they do need to be explained, then you might think, oh, well, self-knowledge is easy because those cases seem easy. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess I think when you start thinking about more complex, more realistic cases in the everyday run of life, it no longer starts to seem, no longer seems so easy. Mm. So uh, in terms of our uh, mental life and what we do, how significant a role does self-awareness self play uh, versus the awareness of the moment and reacting to the moment? I'm inc inclined to think that we don't have a whole lot of self-awareness mm. in day-to-day -day life, right? What we focus on, what we pay attention to, what we care about is what's going on in our physical and social environment for the most time, most part, right? So if I'm having a social interaction with someone, if I'm talking to you, I'm paying attention to you, I'm paying attention to what you're saying, I'm paying attention to the features of the social situation, maybe I pay a little attention to my own speech, right? But as soon as I'm doing that, I'm doing it right now, right? right I start to right. be become disfluent. Yeah, right, it's, right, it's not right, the usual right, thing, right, right? Right, right? What you remember is not your stream of experience. What you remember, what you attend to, is the outer world. And it's a kind of an unusual thing when we turn our gaze upon ourselves. And then, and when we do it, we're not, I think, very good at it. And we reach all kinds of wrong conclusions based on our theories about how things must be, based on the desire to flatter ourselves into thinking we're, mm -hmm. you know, better than we are. <laughs> uh, some would use uh, human self-awareness as the great differentiator between humans and other animals. Is that legitimate? I think we probably are more self-aware than other animals are. Well, the, the question is not more. Yeah. We're, we're more of a lot of things. The question yeah. is, is there a step function difference that humans are self-aware and, and other animals are not? That seems unlikely to me. My inclination is to think that we're not as different as we like to think from mm. other primates. Mm. So my inclination is to think that, you know, if you look at chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, they have a certain amount of self-awareness, maybe not a whole lot. We have more, mm. right? But actually probably not a whole lot either, right? So I wouldn't, I'm not inclined to think. Because you, you would, in essence, downgrade, if that's the right word, yeah. human self-awareness, and, and maybe we're learning more about uh, animal self-awareness, yeah. so maybe they're closer than most people thought. Yeah, that, <laughs> that's what I'm inclined to think, yeah.